brush care, how to avoid destroying your Warhammer paintbrushes. Everything looks normal other than there's some tape and I don't know what the tape is for and that makes me uneasy. When you buy expensive brushes, not looking after them is just a bit counterintuitive in my mind. Notice that what I'm doing is I'm drawing the brush completely black. There's no forward motion. Well, this is the problem. There's always logic. This podcast is brought to you by us. If you're a fan of the show and you want to support us, then you should know that we have dropped some really cool merch on the Siege Studios shop. We've got several shirt designs with this really cool graphic on it, which has loads of cool painting nods and references. I've been wearing mine all of the time for months now, and I genuinely get compliments constantly from people who have absolutely no idea what Warhammer is. The shirts are really nice, high quality cotton, and everything is in stock and dispatched by us. None of that print to order nonsense. So if you want to check out the designs for yourself and see the other merch that we have on the shop, head to the link in this episode's description or go to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. And if you use the code POD10 at checkout, you'll save 10% and you'll get a free sticker pack with your order. Hello everyone and welcome to Paint Perspective episode 64. James, we've got another guest this week. We do, yeah, it's good. None other than I, Joe. I don't like this slide. <laughs> <laughs> It was funny one, and then we, you know, no, what the I mean, more, then we need to knock it on the head. Isn't no, yeah, everyone it, keeps it, on leaving comments about it, so I'm just gonna, it, it, I'm leaning it, in now. It will still be appreciated. Not guests. This is my chat. <laughs> well, I don't know. Statistically, recently, like, recently, they're this isn't where the guest sits. No, James no, changes that scene. So true. people did respect uh, that in the episode with you and Paul, you uh, you took I'll Paul's back seat my, back in yours. My, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not Paul's seat, is it? Well, to be fair, me and, me and him have been in it more than you recently. So, so yeah. I wonder. Um, it's going to. I didn't even think of that. I just assumed. Yeah, I don't know. I just sat. Well, I sat in my seat, didn't I? I think it's going to reach a turning point where you're going to be like outnumbered by how many episodes you've appeared on. Oh, you think there's going to be more without me than with me? Yeah, it's going to reach. We're getting close. We're on Is this some like reverse psychology to try and get me on more episodes? <laughs> <laughs> well, people always, people always like it when you're on. So this is the class. This is the the trio that started. We built. Yeah, this. of course, of course. Yeah. Um, you paved but, the way for for Paul. Yeah, but without me, <laughs> without me stepping aside every now and then, they wouldn't have some some great episodes. Yeah, Paul, had, so. the, the knowledge of Paul and, and going mental with color would not exist. Exactly. So, yeah. true. so yeah. it's true. Well, speaking of guests, we had a good guest last week. We did. Most That's certainly. one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. Actually, yeah. was really it good. was a very very good chat about lots of different things. Um, and really, his approach. Uh, I don't think I've met anybody in painting that paints the way that he does and using a new technique on a new project and mastering that technique over that project this is a really interesting way um hats yeah, off to I, him for doing it i don't know if you've seen the episode or not yet joe but basically uh he's got multiple gaming armies that he has mm -hmm. and every single army is him practicing a new technique so you know how we say the thing of like oh get us if you want to learn something get a squad yeah and then like you paint the first one and then you paint the second one and the third one He'll do that for a whole army. Right. So he'll be like, I want to learn how to airbrush. Time to start an Emperor's Children army. <laughs> yeah. 3,000 points. And he'll that do the whole thing. Way. It's a good way to make sure he gets some armies done, I suppose. Yeah. But this, his next one is, he said he wants to learn freehand. So he's doing an entire Bretonian army. And he's doing all of the banners and like all the cloth and stuff. He's doing freehand. I mean, yeah, that's a completely rational thing to do. If you want <laughs> to you you, just I, learn freehand, uh, do a full army that involves absolutely loads of freehand. My problem is I'd be so, I'd be like especially if it was something like freehand where I'm, I'm I don't know his level of freehand currently but if I decided to do that the first one I did would be so awful <laughs> that even if by the end of the army I was like moderately okay You're gonna have to or go possible <laughs> The first one would just look so bad. That's all right. You can just say that, you know, different squires of those knights, if you're doing the Batoni army, they're, they're as good or worse. We've got the yeah, apprentices they're, they're, to do they're, they're, this they're, one. They're, yeah, <laughs> so you put those ones at the front, they die quickly, and then yeah. and then you're left with all the lovely ones at the end that of the That is game. something I'm interested in, actually, is working out some law reasons as to why my painting is worse on some models. That's quite a good... I think I'll focus more on that than that. <laughs> this is why I say that law is an important part of the, of, of the miniatures. Yeah. We, we put, with that episode as well, we put up a clip. Yeah, mental. That's all. That went absolutely mental. That I was, think we broke the internet. <laughs> that was the equivalent of the Yellowstone uh, magma volcano erupting. That was yeah. it. Was pretty. It was pretty. Pretty crazy. I um, I saw the clip, and I feel like, I feel like I predicted the reaction. Being honest, because I I could I could see where a lot of the comments were coming from. And I kind of thought that when I was going into it. I do think 
I think you we've already spoke about this, but I think you missed the mark a little bit on the video game. What do people keep saying? Oh, computer game. Computer <laughs> game. <laughs> computer game. James on says, the computer yeah. game uh, analogy. I just want to throw in, thank you for everybody that did back me yeah, up all and, two stay, of you. Uh, and stay computer games rather than video games. I've, I'm not the only one. That, right, Joe, back me up. 80s. If you say computer games, you sound ancient. It is... <laughs> It is an older terminology, I, I would feel. That's what, it's like, still factual, it's still true, it's still what they are. But I, but I, is play, a, it, I played them on a computer first before a console. Yeah, no, but like, if you say so, in modern day, you just sound old. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not modern day. I was born in 86, all right? Okay. Yeah. You're not so, even that old. You're like young for a lot of the listeners. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, uh, yeah, I do get, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, if I, if I say, if you say computer games, I think of, you playing like uh, what's the the one with like just the pong? <laughs> pong. Yeah. Give me a break! That was yeah. played on a TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you sit at home playing pong. That's just what I think just of. to clarify the clip. Like, yeah, that's probably a worse take. That's that's just, worse. TV. <laughs> just, just to clarify the clip thing. So we had a conversation in that episode, a yeah. full conversation, and as always, unfortunately, it's hard to translate a twenty minute conversation into a sixty second clip. So yeah. there's that. The conversation was talking about how the value of Warhammer. If you want to view it in a way of like cost per hour, mm. despite Warhammer being incredibly expensive as a hobby, maybe less than others, but yeah. more than others. But I think it sits in like the sort of mid range. Uh, despite the models being quite expensive individually to buy, if you're someone who spends a lot of time painting them and a lot of time playing with them, the cost per hour yeah. of buying a box of Space Marines, for example, is very, very low. And I said that as someone who's struggled with video gaming a lot in recent years, I often find myself, there's a new game that comes out. All my friends are talking about it. I'll buy it on PlayStation. What's the new game now? It's like 70 quid. It's ridiculous. And we'll play it like twice. And I'll think like, oh, it's kind of meh. Like it's incomplete. This is the thing with games now that come out, buggy, incomplete, whatever. We play it like two or three times. I think it's kind of meh. And then I kind of regret my purchase because I feel like I didn't get a very good value out of it. That was the point that I was making. Yeah, but I just think that is not indicative of the wider video game computer game experience like a lot of people who are spending because we, we're talking about people if you're comparing it you were talking about doing warhammer as a hobby mm -hmm. and that's your hobby and that's what you're spending hours on so if someone's hobby is video games they're very often not spending 70 pound on a game to play it for two hours they're probably like a lot of people pointed out, waiting for like Steam sales and stuff mm. and spending hundreds of hours on some of these games. So I could just see instantly why people were going to get like riled up about it. Like I just have to throw in, I'm absolutely ignorant to video games. I'll say the right <laughs> term. Um, so I couldn't really relate to any of that. The reason why I, I, I actually said that I, I'm, I'm so glad that you said that is because I, in the larger well, you said that to, to you said that to what Quipster said, yeah. right? Not to what George. No, said not to what George said about, about obviously Quipster saying that he it's, he thinks it's good value for money. Um, yes, I understand. There's a there's a there is a cost it, to get into it buying the kits, and I look, I think one of the things that I saw in the comments quite a lot was yeah, but it's not just paying forty pound for for um uh, for the for, models. For the models. You got to buy all the paints. Yeah, so that's totally correct, hundred percent. I think the reason why I personally said that I really glad you said that, and I agree with it, is because going back to that cost per hour and also the fact that you can pick them up at any point in the future and add to them, strip them, paint them again, add more to them. You've got the gaming side of it. Not that I do that much anyway, but there's, there's a lot of things that I think that for the initial investment, plus also all the things that you need to have to be able to do it, that does give you a good value for money in my mind. I have, I have two things to add quickly. Firstly, on the video game thing that I said, I 100% agree i think all of the criticism i've received have been very fair i think it wasn't worded very well and i totally understand what everyone is saying when i made that point i was talking about my own personal recent experience mm. i wasn't necessarily speaking about video games as a hobby that being said i have seen it like in my friends and stuff who do play games a lot and feel like they waste the money that's neither here nor there i i'm not like trying to backpedal i, I think fair points were raised second point being none of us said warhammer is not expensive yeah. We all have said it's expensive. What we were saying was we get good value out of it yeah. in terms of how much we spend. I think and I will stand by that. I've not, I don't spend like crazy amounts of money on models because I buy a few boxes here and there. I spend a couple hundred hours painting a box usually. Yeah. I get all my value out of it there. I, I feel like it's money well spent. I think it's just the topic of whether something is value for money or not is so subjective well, from what say, you yeah. do with, your, with that thing and how much you personally value that thing. 
Because, for example, even the cinema comparison. Oh, don't get me started on that. I've got. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I've got a fresh. No, something no. I'm about just that. saying. Even the like, cinema comparison. Um, someone might value those couple of hours at the cinema seeing a film more than they value a hundred hours doing a different hobby. So it's like even cost per hour goes out the window really because it's, yeah. it's your personal value of that activity. And not everyone's valuing stuff in terms of cost per hour because it's like no, more exactly. concentrated fun in a short amount of exactly. time. Exactly. It yeah. doesn't make it a wrong point. Like it is correct. You could probably work out that cost per hour you get more out of one thing than another. But it's like is anyone have you ever really have you ever really when you're doing a hobby have you ever really thought about oh this is brilliant cost per hour like, I love it no you're just enjoying the thing yeah, that you get value out yeah. of the thing so I think because it's so different for everyone that topic is just bound to get an absolute it's a messy like, topic like 50-50 yeah. yeah. it's, a, it's a fun discussion to have and see everyone's points there 100% yeah I mean there was loads of great comments there was loads of loads of things on there that was interesting to read and different things the one thing that I've got well the first thing value as we as, as clearly demonstrated in that is completely subjective to the individual like someone one person's value is completely different to another and it's also a few things that people brought up it's relative to like where you are in the world exactly, how expensive yeah. it is yeah, like so how much money you earn try working out in Australia yeah, yeah I know like I was like yeah that's that's a fair point. But the cinema thing, like, I, I, all I've got to say is, where is everybody getting cheap cinema? Because I... I it's so expensive. I, 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 I'm not even, someone said they go for like $10. I was like, that is... No, that, cinema cinema can be... Well, I, I get Quipsters in London, so his prices yeah. are probably well, around here, bit, around the airway, it's still it's about as expensive I, I, as that. It's not, though, is it? I, not where, the, where I am, which is not that far from here, it is on a weekend... It is fifteen ninety nine for a ticket. Yeah. So if two of you go, you're already over thirty quid. And then if well, you there's food. there's a there's a particular. I don't know if I want to be naming like actual things, but there's a big brand of cinema, a big chain cinema around there that do like five pound tickets. I've never seen them, and that's my ignorance on it. Then I genuinely haven't. But I know you can get the monthly thing where you pay monthly and you can go and see as many. Films there is as that you as like. well. Yeah. But like, yeah. yeah, there's there's a there's a. Yeah, there's a big cinema I've never chain seen that. that do five pound well, tickets. Hook so me like, up because <laughs> so it's like, equally though, we could go the other way. We talk about like the things that's cheaper, but there's also hobbies that are insanely expensive by comparison. <laughs> yeah. It's like people talking about like cars as a as a very big example. Like that's a, a popular thing in our sort of culture around here. Like especially people like my age are into cars, whatever. Mm. They're spending like literally thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands on, on a yeah. headlamp nonsense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think yeah, no, no one is trying to say that. Warhammer is cheap. And also I kind of took maybe this was out of context and and potentially incorrect, but my I took it as rather than saying like oh Warhammer is good value for money, I did take it as like miniature painting as a whole yeah. or like wargaming as a whole is good value for money. But a lot of the comments were people saying like no Warhammer isn't but this other company is or something like that. And I yeah. kind of took it as an umbrella thing anyway. Yeah. But I think because people are so like People get up caught people, in the nuance of Games Workshop miniatures. Yeah, well, pe people are just so ready to be angry at like, oh, Games Workshop is expensive. Yeah. That like, they just jump on that anyway. I don't know what, what Quips is, uh, or, or whoever brought it up, what the um, intention was. But I, I thought that, thing, that he meant, I thought that he meant like, in general, wargaming, miniature painting, but... Warhammer is like the one, isn't it's the, it? So it's, it's like, also like the it's like the jacuzzi thing, isn't it? It's like Warhammer just becomes the word. For, <laughs> yeah. The only thing that I'll, thing. I'll throw in is like, and the thing that the way I look at it is, it's, it's really different in in a couple of aspects, and I want to explain this. So first thing is like, Quipster did caveat by saying value for money doesn't mean like, not expensive. Not expensive. Like he did say that to be to. It just does it. That's just a fact, yeah. though. That doesn't mean like you can have something that is expensive and also value yeah. for money. Hundred thousand pound house, great value. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that's well, cheap. That's cheap for housing. Like yeah, in, in England, that's depends cheap on the house. I'll take yeah. what I can get in yeah. this economy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the thing I was going to say as well is is that like I saw I read through a lot of the comments and like a lot of them obviously were very negative for certain things, obviously for, for GW and stuff like that. But what I wanted to say is like when you compare, I mean look. A lot of people brought up obviously 3D printing. That's a whole new, a whole other sort of like minefield to walk through. But what I, what I would say is that like there was a lot of comparisons between miniature companies and in, uh, in our industry. But I, I've, I will say this, and I will die on the hill of the fact that GW started 40 plus years ago. Their plastics, in my opinion, are some of the best in the industry. And you don't take and you don't you you people see things at face value. And what I mean by that is you see the box of marines and you see the price tag, or you see the, the box of miniatures and the price tag. 
you don't look into the all the stuff that cost is behind it. First things first. I don't think that's relevant to the end user. I though. don't know. I know it's not, but there, there's still reasons why that the costs are the costs. And also, when you look at the industry, GW products are branded and promoted as a premium product in the industry. So there is going to be a higher. No, cost. but to be fair, if you're someone who hasn't got a lot of money and you see Boxer Space Marines has gone up by another ten percent or whatever, and they're starting to price you out, you're not going to sit there and go, "Oh, well, to be fair to GW, though, their tooling costs." No, yeah, well, quite no, no, I get that. But my, I, <laughs> yeah. I totally get that. But my point, I even said it in the episode. I said like. There's a there's always a way to get the miniatures that you want, and that's whether it's on eBay. People did you skip split, that bit. You split, yeah. you split the box. Like I've done it before. Like when Dark Imperium came out, one of my mates wanted an Urgle side, and I wanted the Marine side. So we split the box. Obviously, that that box had a, a, a cost to it for everything in there, and I split that with somebody. I think that actually like, ties say, into what people said about the the game thing, though. Is people said, "Oh, you can get Steam games like on sale," and I'm like, "But you can buy Warhammer secondhand, and you can buy." Box, you can split boxes with your friends. Yeah. You can buy them from like third party retailers who are discounted and stuff. The One thing so I, I thought will that was say a bit strange as well on the note of those starter boxes is I know it's kind of it's within their own ecosystem of pricing anyway, so it's kind of easy for them to do. But those starter boxes of whenever there's an addition or something, they are great value for money. Even if you think Warhammer is expensive. Like the amount of yeah, that, stuff you get in those starter boxes, like they do. That's one thing that I think Warhammer does very well. Is it a, a good, a good, a box. good box, a good yeah. big box set? Like, yeah, the, the individual kits and everything are pretty expensive, but like that, I've always thought they're there. When you're getting like seventy, eighty miniatures in a box, I'm like, yeah. oh, this is brilliant. Yeah, those models as well. Once once those boxes are released, if you haven't split it with a friend, if there's a specific model in that box that you like or or whatever, you can. They always end up on eBay. Like the eBay is flooded with like individual models of the breaking breaking down of mm. those boxes. So like. As I, as I said, in that, well, that's in to that, my point. You can buy online, secondhand, yeah. or like people have taken bigger boxes and broken them down and so on. So like, you can get it cheaper. There, there's a whole host of trading groups on Facebook. You've got Gumtree, you've got Marketplace, you've got Craigslist in the state. You've got loads of different places that where you can get miniatures that you want, not for RRP or direct from manufacturer or even a, a local game store. You can just get them. And and this is why I, I said that the community is so good because there's so many different ways to get access to those miniatures that you want. It's not like there's this wall that you just can't climb over. And and and, and I understand everyone has different situations. Of course, that's that's perfectly understandable. But I still think there's a way for you to get the model that you want through different mediums, if that makes sense. You know, Gaff, how's that going? Hobby set up. Well, the hobby set up is there. There. What does a, there mean? Has you, you DM'd me and asked me for the links to them shelves and the command structure. Yeah, I've stuff. got them. They're not up yet, though. Oh, okay. I've got, basically, like I said, it's the, it's the, <laughs> it's the office room. It's like the spare room, basically. Yeah. That's the last of my worries at the minute. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's the last one getting, getting the treatment. So it's just a bit of a... That'd so, literally be my first room I'd be sorting out. I'd have like, I'd be that guy who like, you go in my house. It's a st like mattress on the floor. I haven't even bought a bed yet. Yeah. And then you go into like the, the office and it's like, you know, you see those like ridiculous PC setups and all the lights. And yeah. stuff. I'd be doing that. Yeah. Priority one. Hobby room. Um, yeah. Hobby room always comes first. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> well, not for me. I, to, I sorted my bedroom out, then the living room, then now this. But it is getting there. It's got, you know, the desk is up and everything and the, you know, I've got stuff in there, but I haven't properly planned out like where those i got those adhesive strips and everything uh, where they're going to go and stuff like that so um i'm like dying to get back to it though. i just haven't had the time haven't had the time at all to get that room sorted and it's driving me absolutely crazy get i done. haven't actually wanted to paint like this much in so long i think it's i've always said if you come away from it it brings the urge that's why we always say the thing of um people saying they're burnt out and whatever we're all saying like just don't paint for a while just stop yeah because yeah. the just, urge like, builds back up you need a bit of a break i think yeah. even when you're like really in the swing of things as well it's good to take a break. Yeah. I've been forced to take a break at the minute. Um, and what it's been really it? annoying. What, what, what is oh, I broke my wrist. <laughs> what, we're doing what? Football. <laughs> I think you might be using the wrong part of your... <laughs> so, right, You're using my... goal. You know that, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you are, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> my, my Jesus, friend... who was shooting the ball? Yeah. You broke your wrist. My friends had the brilliant idea to join a six-a-side football league. And I thought, oh, that would be fun. Not realising that these are like aspiring... Footballers. Pro you know, yeah. yeah. That they're not are you not is that not what you want to do no funny that no. Uh, but I thought oh, I'll be fine like we always used to play when we were younger and whatnot. like quite into it so I was like oh yeah we'll give that a go done a bit of training we was feeling good about ourselves 
the uh, the first game I can only describe as abuse. It was <laughs> it was brutal. So I'm I'm goalkeeper. I got absolutely battered, and then uh, yeah, second week just real real powerful shot. Took a block, made the save. To be fair, George yeah, didn't get the but, memo. Uh, Roberto Carlos is playing for the yeah. same side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, uh, when you like dive. Yeah. Are you doing the full, like, you yeah, landed like, Michael. on yeah. your body, like, yeah, like yeah. landing? Oh, I couldn't be doing all that. Couldn't yeah. be doing all that. That hurts, doesn't it? That's part of the job uh, of a goalie. I guess it's kind of, but... I suppose, yeah, you get to rest for most of the game. Yeah, you, so you then spend, you spend you're, six you're... aside, mate. Six <laughs> aside is insane. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, nonetheless, it's, I, I can do it. I'm starting to get to a point now where it's been a couple of weeks, so I can do a little bit of painting now for, like, maybe, like, half an hour. But... I really, I can't bend my wrist, so I can't use my normal like hand position. So I'm having to like yeah. learn to paint quite awkwardly. And it's very frustrating. I'm going to have to start bribing your opponents to do this <laughs> to you more often so that I can catch <laughs> up catch and up. <laughs> finish the army. Uh, yeah. Uh, should we do listen to comments? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's been a minute. Uh, Carl Moore says, is Warhammer value for money is so subjective. And in that you have the question of is GW giving value to the customer? And they've said in 40k land, probably not. And in AOS, probably yes. So that's, that's interesting. interesting throw yeah. in there. Is AOS better value than 40k? I'd need some more context on this, really. I don't really know what, why, why someone would be saying that. Like, what does AOS get? Does he just mean like prefers their models or is AOS like better yeah. supported? Or I, like, I think I, they're getting, this might be on the back of they're getting a lot of support now with the spearhead Are stuff. they getting more free rules and things? Although a lot Possibly. Of, I think a lot so. of 40k, 40K rules are free going now. 40k free a lot of it now though, isn't it? Yeah. So, so. Well, the new, the new, sorry to bring up, but the new Kill Team box that was just announced, all of that's free. That's yeah, like we're, we're going to be talking about that in the in the post show, I think, the new Kill Team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, let us know in the comments. Uh, is AOS better value than 40k? Uh, Although, enlighten us. Obviously, based on what we've just spoke about, I completely agree. It's like, so subjective that's it? true but yeah. maybe there's something a bit more objective about this in terms of the pricing and the yeah. rules and whatnot uh this is this is absolutely brilliant this trey bomamon says <laughs> that's their name i've done it lads i've ascended to peak of water potdom three exquisite jam jars now adorn my painting desk one for an initial clean one for a more thorough rinse and a third one for metallics to keep the mica flakes away from my good brushes Honestly, I don't know what's next. I feel like I've peaked. <laughs> Username, <laughs> profile picture and everything. Really? Yeah. Well, from, yeah. On behalf of the Bon Maman Jam Company and the suggestion that we made, you're very welcome. Can we get a, can we get a sponsorship? I feel like we're due one now. Probably. Hit us up, Bon Maman. If, yeah. if I get black current jam every day of the week and twice on Sunday, I'll be a happy boy. So it's like, People, it's people come back next week we're wearing like the, the tartan like, shirts. Bon Maman hat. Bon Maman hat. There's like jars behind me. <laughs> uh, Porku says you don't need to be good at something to critique it restaurant critics aren't Michelin styled chefs but they do know what good food tastes like same goes for miniature painting you don't need to be an expert at creamy blends and ultra smooth transitions to see them and appreciate them I don't know if I agree with that uh, I understand the context because a food critic is there to just it's the food, the ambience, the restaurant, all of that kind of stuff, and take that all into a review of that. However, I think you kind of need to know what goes into the painting to be able to, obviously someone can look at something and go, well, that's, that's got a load of thick paint on it or whatever. But I think there's lots of things inherently with different techniques that you kind of need to know the way that it was done or how it's approached to be able to, to see whether it's good or not. But then like, I suppose at the same time- I don't agree with that necessarily. Uh, yeah. I think there's maybe a fundamental knowledge that can help you go into more depth when critiquing stuff. I don't stuff. think anyone's suggesting that someone would be a critic with having zero knowledge. Like what they're saying is you don't have to be- as good. You can't only critique people lesser than you. You don't have to be a slayer. I took that it's as- It's not zero it. knowledge, oh, okay, obviously. Like, like yeah. if you, what they're going to say about it? Like, yeah, because otherwise yeah. by your logic, you could only critique someone who's a worse painter than you and that's subjective anyway. No, no. In the whole grand scheme of things, it's art at the end of the day. So, you know, someone throws a bucket of paint at a canvas and it's sold for millions and it's in the tape. Yeah, like, so, like, it's, yeah, it's I, the same with any, yeah, like there's very few yeah. film no, critics fair. that That's are fair. filmmakers. Yeah. It's not because they're, I've said many times before on this podcast, I think that like that person's um, goal or passion is critiquing film, not making film. Yeah. And no, fair. same thing can be said for, no, that's any, a very, very fair point. Critic, and suppose. a film expert might make a bad critic. Exactly. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Happy Dude says, 
the stack is actually a great phrase. It works better than pile of potential uh, because the stack is super helpful because uh, it can be sorted and have a priority order and value. Uh, so not everything has equal value in the stack. So this is Quipster said last week, you've got, we spoke about the stash in the scale model community. The stack, he said, comes from the Gundam right. uh, collective. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they call it the stack, I guess. I, I think that is the best one. You think? Yeah, it brings order to <laughs> the pile. The pile sounds like a mess, even if it's a pile of potential. What about the stash? The stash again. It sounds there's some shame. Uh, it's a way, It's yeah. a stash. It's like a mess. It's hidden, but it's like a big box. You can just yeah, fill yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, whereas the stack is orderly mm. and presented and proud. Do you, so, like a bit of order? you like a bit of organization, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, not in my office currently, but uh, <laughs> um, I would not call it a stack at the minute in the office. That is very much <laughs> a stash <laughs> or a pile. Um, but what yeah, do you like consider your dark angels at the minute? What do you mean? What are your dark angels army that you've started? Would you well, consider that like a pile, a stack, a stash? Um, that is, <laughs> well, they're all in the boxes, so that is a stack. <laughs> <laughs> it is a stack. <laughs> Um, do you know what? That's, I'm, that's I'm an inventory a, at that point. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think uh, that's a good word, inventory. I like that. I, I'm, uh, I was supposed to be playing a test game early September. Why well, is that going to work if they're in the box? Let's see what everything. Just move the boxes around I'm gonna the table. I'm going to make it happen, mate. I'm feeling pretty good about my odds now. I've started another Blood Angel half, you know. There's no way. Like, do you know, you see how chill I am about it? Like, I'm not You're even too bothered. chill. All it's going to catch up with all you. All my stuff is in boxes. Yeah. Bear in mind you had a 60 week head start or whatever it is. And you've got <laughs> that about, number's gone bigger. It was two not models. It literally was like 60 I think we weeks. worked it out, George. It was 60. It was like 60 weeks or something. You've painted about two and a half models. Do you know what I mean? I'm chilling. I'm fine. Like I could start in December and I'm still going to beat you, I think. I have painted three exemplars now as well. So That's I'm a different you, army. I'm catching you up. <laughs> <laughs> I painted as, more exemplars than I have audience. As, so. uh, as many uh, listeners, uh, many of my fans pointed out um, <laughs> um my standards are way lower than yours so i don't know if that's they, a compliment that's Joe. why they believe in me um i took it as a compliment i decided to take it as the a fans rally behind you because they said ah he's the worst player he's, he's, so he's, he's, <laughs> he's the worst one so he's gonna get they said he's a good critic but he's a bad painter and he's gonna he's gonna that's what people first. are saying yeah. that's people are saying yeah, yeah. so if you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that you're looking to take miniature painting more seriously and improve your skills. We're asked all the time by listeners of this podcast how you can paint like our artists here at Siege, and now you can learn how with our Siege Studios painting and sculpting classes. We teach a variety of fundamental and advanced techniques that are integral to the painting methodologies that we use here at Siege. Our day and weekend classes have been developed over eight years of teaching experience developing painters from all skill levels in venues across the UK. You'll walk away with practical skills and techniques that you can take away and nurture so you can start seeing better results and grow as a painter. To book tickets to your local venue now before they sell out, head to the link in this episode's description or go to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. All right, main topic for this week, brush care, how to avoid destroying your Warhammer paintbrushes. So we've done a previous episode on Warhammer brushes, the truth about them, which ones you should buy, mm. things to avoid. This is like stage two. So you've bought your brushes, you've used them. You've been using them for months yeah. and they're knackered. Presumably you haven't cleaned them at all. Not once, you haven't even rinsed them. Yeah. You haven't done a tray bomb them on and uh, <laughs> yeah. stick to your regimen. Uh, so naturally, what do you do to clean them? Maintenance, mm. whatnot. I think it's a bit of a, do you think a bit of mystique around like brush care and stuff? People have got some like wacky little products they like to use. I think it's one of those things that gets targeted by a lot of um, fads, like gizmos, gadgets. Gizmo. Oh, we love a gadget, gadget, a gadget and gizmo and gizmos. So like, yeah, like we've the spoke brush about toilet. the brush toilet, which someone did actually comment about how they use it and they, not they enjoy it. it. I, I'm not having I, it. I ref absolutely refuse to no. use anything um, called a toilet. But that's to... what I'm getting at is there's so many, even like the GW paint pot mm. ha is this like thing of like- It's got like grooves and stuff. Oh, it has inside, grooves it? in yeah. the bottom. And then it has like a th uh, like a little slits in the side to like draw off, draw a point and stuff. So it's like what I'm getting at is there's a lot of people try and overcomplicate brush care with little products and stuff all the time. I think that leads to some confusion. Do you know what I'd like to see? I was washing my car the other day. I do it myself normally at home. 
and I've got like a fancy bucket. It's got in the bottom. It's called a grit guard. Mm. It's like this, um, like plastic, like grate almost. It sits like two or three inches above the bottom. Mm. And the idea is that when you're washing your car, all the dirt and stuff goes under it. So when you mm. put your wash mitt in, you're not picking up the rubbish. Oh, okay, I wonder man. if we could get one of those for like a water pot, a sediment a little, guard. Yeah, a little grit guard to go at the bottom. There you go. Some company will jump on that. Jump on within... that. Three, that'll be a three D print. I'm three D printing that. Are you? Uh, I'm doing, like, no, I'm doing you, that. I'm more worried about what you're painting with. You point painting with cement or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, what? You know, right. What the hell are you using a grit guard for? Hear me out. Like, you know I'm right. You know <laughs> when you've been using. You know when you've been using your water pot for a while. End of a session. All the sediment like starts going to the bottom. Yeah, but and then when you put your brush in, it if it touches the bottom, the you're like. Yeah, but still, it around how, and all what, that filth. How, how dense is the paint you're using? To have how much, like, yeah, clean it. Yeah, I suppose I need three water pots, like tried by my mum. Yeah. Well, there you go. You could do a pack of three. Anyway. Anyway. That's that's what, that, there's my point. George just come up with one in the space of like 60 seconds of talking about it. So that's my point. There's too many. And that's what, that's what all these companies are doing. They're just like, oh, yeah. run with that. Run with that, Jim. Come on, go. Ship yeah. it. Ship it. Yeah. yeah. So, so th there you go. And that's how you end up with a brush toilet. Yeah. Um, and I think it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, so we're here to simplify it, I hope, although I do see what I think is tape in the, right, okay. uh, let's, demo let's, let's, you'll be, if you're, you'll if you're be, listening. I thought, do you know what I thought <laughs> this was going to be the most normal, like when you said, oh, yeah, we're going to do a demo. It's of clean, James. Clean Why did brushes. you think that? Wait, 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 I, like, oh, we're going to do a demo of cleaning the brushes. And I was like, oh, that's a nice normal one. Um, that will be fairly straightforward. And like a lot of my brush care is stuff that I've sort of learned from James um, and I've been all right. Do you know what I mean? And then we've sat down and there's, everything looks normal other than there's some tape and I don't know what the tape is for and that makes me uneasy. The tape is just off, so off camera. If you're, if you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, your audio app of choice, I strongly suggest you head over to YouTube for this one because we're going to have a classic Paint Perspective Blue Peter demo. We've set up, for, we've, we've pre-set up for this one. We've, we've upped the production value this yeah. week. Uh, James, you've got a, a, an assortment of knickknacks and gadgets. Yeah, the tape, the tape, just so the tape can move into the shot. shot. There so we go. Right. See the okay. tape there. So, do you want to okay. run us through everything that you've got here? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to get into what it's for yet. No, but do you want to just no, list no, off That's just your ingredients? Just the list. Yeah, so, just a list. What are you going to need to bake this cake? So, we have got 350 grams of tape. Yeah. So, we've got some tape, which I'll explain about. And you're laughing now, but I'll be the one laughing at the end. Uh, we've got. No, it'll be us. Don't worry, got, James. We've, we've got, got that covered. No, we've got the tape has got it covered. Don't worry about that. Um, uh, so I'm intrigued. We've well, got then. obviously some water, uh, airbrush thinner or cleaner. Uh, I'll put both there, but you can you can have e either one. Right, we're already off to a bad start because um, those are different products, and James has just described them as if they're the same thing. I will explain why shortly. Um, uh, a vessel of some kind. A vessel. Uh, a vessel. Uh, it can be a shot glass. <laughs> it can be your tray. Tray mamon bon mamon jar. It can be whatever you want it to be, but something that holds uh, liquid. Uh, another another liquid will be good. Um, we have uh, some. This is Artist Soap's brush soap, but you can use Master's brush soap. You can use uh, shampoo. I recommend. I like. You can put L'Oreal soap. Bar of soap. You can put L'Oreal if your brushes are worth it on them. Whatever <laughs> whatever you choose to use is perfectly fine. Um, you can use conditioner and shampoo. So at the end of the day, if you're using Kalinsky's and you're using uh, animal hair, it is hair. So why not use the products that are designed to invigorate and rejuvenate uh, hair. And that's, Will that's definitely why. all of these things you've got here in this demo work for synthetic brushes as well? Yes, they will work for synthetics as well. So, is this, uh, But this is more geared This is more geared towards Kalinsky's, Kalinsky's but if you're hair. using synthetics, they will also work on synthetics. Um, bear in mind that the one thing I will say about synthetics is that um, sometimes when you're using strong paints like inks or contrast and stuff like that, they do stain the hair. That does inevitably change the color of the hair. If you're using the synthetic with maybe white, sort of tinted sort of fibers or whatever, it will stain. So those stains are very hard to remove. That doesn't mean that your brush that's stained pink or blue or red or whatever, when you use another paint, is going to put pink or red or blue into that other paint. So that's just something to be conscious of. Um, this process does not remove stain from synthetic I, brushes. I found actually with natural hair brushes, they don't stain in the same way, but over time they get darker. Yes, like a lot that's darker. correct. They yeah. start out quite like a correct. nice light correct. brown and then mm. they'll end up near black yeah mm, towards the end of their 100, life 100% so I've got uh, a selection of brushes as well so I've got uh, a couple that are clean and new and a couple that are uh, a bit haggard and a bit used alright and there's a couple with a few different types of um, types of kind of like uh, problems do you want to well. show off the absolute state of that large one at the end there uh, this one yeah yeah it's got some grey paint in the middle we'll get some better shots of this so you can see I'll try not, I won't clean this one so you can see it and give you an example but um, there's a few here that I've got that have got different problems which I picked out this morning from my, but, my 
my in, stack of brushes. In short, um, though, they're all like yeah. they're all splayed, and they're yeah, not yeah, they're all super splayed. sharp. Yeah, they're minute, all splayed, so. and they're not super super sharp. So yeah, and admittedly, I mean, this size six is just it's it's clean, but it's just dried out, so the head's open, bushed out. But other than that, if you re wet that, that'll go back into a perfect point. Um, so yeah, so I, I've got four here that have got different problems. Um, some of them have got paint in the ferrule, some of them have got paint on the mid drift, uh, and I'll explain obviously what that is as we go through. In general, um, when it comes to brush care, it is probably something that I would recommend that you do on a case by case basis. Um, and what I mean by that is really you should check your brushes, in my opinion, probably between at the end, once a week to once a fortnight. Okay. Because um, that probably depends on how much you paint. It as does well. depend on how much you paint, you paint. every two weeks. It I wouldn't depends, be checking there's in a between couple, there's, a couple, there's a couple of variables. So <laughs> I paint once a month. I clean my brushes once every week. Yeah. It's a regiment. So Mr. Miyagi, like regimented <laughs> yeah. thing every single day. It's, it's actually really relaxing cleaning brushes. So it's a de stressing you exercise. Think? Yeah, it is actually. It's relaxing um, quite, until you uh, realize yeah. you've ruined your 35 pound brush. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is that. Um, well, one thing, one thing I will say is that, yeah, it is dependent on how much you paint. Uh, if you're painting regularly, I would probably recommend checking them weekly, fortnightly. Um, and, and this is situational in the sense of if you're not applying the two thirds rule. And I want to talk about that before we get into actual cleaning. Two thirds rule is essentially on a brush. Uh, when you're painting with a brush, um, I wouldn't recommend with the Kalinsky uh, putting paint on more than the front two thirds. So having the end near the ferrule as the no go zone, the danger zone, if you want to call it anything. All right. Okay. Um, don't go into the danger zone. Stay. You feel like stay. a bit risque, Joe. You like load up a brush, you're like oh, yeah. I'm going oh, in the oh, court, final yeah. quarter. This is this is. I what? I don't even go to two thirds. I'm too scared. Half and really? half. I do like. You're, you're, not, you're not using 50, the belly 50, of the brush, then though. You're not making the most of the. Yeah, the, but it's, I'm too the fear. Yeah, yeah, I'm too anxious about it. Don't want to ruin it. Bit of a this fifth, might help though. I've never. 50, 50. This is this where the tape comes out. No, I'd actually argue that by not doing that you're at higher risk of ruining your brush because you're only using the tip. You're putting a lot of wear on it and it's going to dry out faster. Yeah. And therefore you're putting a lot of flex. <sighs> right, look, I didn't come here to be judged. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, so two thirds rule is, is something I'd buy. And I'd also just say, if you're getting paint out of a paint pot to put it on your palette, I would use a different brush to the one that you're loading to actually paint with. So then that means that you're not jabbing the lovely 35 pound or expensive Kalinsky brush. I'll, I'll have to bleep this, but I call it my brush. <laughs> <laughs> the workhorse brush. Let's, let's, yeah. The workhorse brush yeah. is the one that we're going to be using to take paint out. Um, and if you have got a brush that is ruined beyond repair, um, this process does repair brushes really, really well. But um, but I would definitely recommend if you've got a an, an brush that is haggard, then that would be the brush that you would use to take paint out of paint pots. Right. So what we're going to do now, first thing I want to talk about is uh, the cleaner or thinner. Now, George, you're quite right. They're very different chemicals. But the one thing that I would say that they both do is break down paint in, in their capacity. The thinner obviously thins paint for usage in the airbrush and the cleaner is used in an airbrush, but ultimately it's used to remove anything that builds up within the airbrush, okay, and paint. So they both effectively dilute or break down paint. George's eyes twitching. Uh, would you agree or disagree? I, I would agree. Yeah. However, I would add a third principle in there that the cleaner is also there because it acts as a lubricant for the needle and your seals to that, keep them from drying out. That is very correct. Yes. Now you don't you don't really need lubricant on the brushes, being honest. Um, but the purpose of which now the reason I'm I've got both here is because you might have one or have the other. I'd recommend having either or. Um, they both do the job perfectly well. I actually have more cleaner here with me today than I do thinner. So I'm actually going to use cleaner because there's more in the pot. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get some cleaner and we're going to put it in the vessel. Okay. The right, vessel. Okay. Jesus okay. Christ. It's going to go in the vessel. All right. Okay. And we're going to put a nice... Joe, Joe's done. Joe's done. <laughs> He's got it. Uh, we're going like, to put a nice... I thought this one was going to be a normal one. It is normal. Why did you think that? It is normal. Because it's cleaning brushes and we've spoken about cleaning it's brushes. James. Multiple it's Multiple times normal. and nothing mental's ever come up. Whenever we've spoke about cleaning brushes, he's never said vessel and he's never whipped some tape out. Okay. The ta I'm, even I'm not sure what the tape <laughs> right. is for. Okay. I'm excited. So I'm get, excited. Get, it is tape. good, the tape. So, Don't disappoint right. us with the tape. I'm not going to disappoint you. So, um, so the clean, I don't want to distract from the from the thing. So the cleaner's in the vessel. The cleaner is in the vessel. Now, Hang um, on, where's the bomb mon jar? What's this glass about? Yeah. Well, for, for viewing pleasure, I've yeah, chosen yeah. something that's a bit smaller. They're not so paying for so, advertising yet. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. And fair. we haven't got that sponsorship yet either. So Yeah, yeah. Until, so, until they shill out for us, then we're going to have to start using glasses. So, um. Obviously, we've got a brush. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, use the brush uh, and put it onto the side. So I'm going to do this from this angle here so you can kind of see. Uh, I'm going to get the brush and I'm just going to work it into the cleaner. And I'm going to just, with a bit of friction, I'm going to work the brush and turn it on the side wall of the vessel. All right. Okay. 
Um, Tommy's what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to work the cleanup through the brush head so that it it, it basically gets into every single bit of the head of the of the brush and helps to break down any paint that's on the uh, on the actual follicles themselves. Is the friction relevant here? It, it is a little bit because you want you don't want to just put it in the middle and move it around in the, need a the bit of abrasion. Box. You need a bit of abrasion to, to literally help the cleaner or the thinner, whatever you're using respectively to break down, obviously the paint that's in there. Now this is where it gets a bit, a bit more sort of like sort of factual. What tends to happen with paint is when it dries, if you've not cleaned the brush head properly in the center of the brush, you'll notice little sort of nodules of paint or marks on the, in the center of the brush head. And what typically happens is uh, that those sort of nodules kind of stick to the hair follicle. You can do this with rubber gloves if you want. The reason why I don't is because rubber gloves tend to put a bit more friction on the brush head and this is where you can pull hairs out. What I tend to do is I actually leave a little bit of thumbnail on my thumb a little bit longer. So what I do is I tweeze the brush head in between my fingers. So you've got to prep for this. You're like, you're going to clip your nails yeah. and you think yeah. like, hang on, I've got to clean my brushes. Well, so well, if you're I'm working the it thumb. into your All weekly routine, you know, to not clip your nails on a Sunday until <laughs> after... <laughs> Until after you clean the brush brushes, yeah. yeah. So as you said, the, the brush head is obviously wet with clean up. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to tease between my finger and thumb the brush head. Just a little bit of pressure just to literally help. And as I mentioned, if you've got a little bit of thumbnail, you can just feel your thumbnail, touch the hair and just put a little bit of force just to work out any of those any of those little bits of paint sort of that are stuck to the middle of the hair. Now, the reason why getting those nodules of paint that are sort of midsection on the brush is really important is because... What tends to happen with those sort of that paint build up on the brush head is it weakens the, the hair on the brush head where the paint's surrounding it. And what tends to happen is like a split end or like a sort of bit of hair on human human heads, those hairs will snap off. And that's where the brushes start to lose their length. They start to lose their flex, all the things that you don't want from a painting uh, paintbrush. I'm going to go back to the vessel and I'm going to introduce <laughs> the paint the brush again. All right. Okay. And again, work on the side wall of the cup, just to literally using that thinner. Um, and you'll notice already that that thinner has actually got a bit of a tint to it where there's it's broken down something. It's not as clean as it was when it first went in, which is breaking down anything that's in that brush head at all whatsoever. All right, okay. Now, thinner or cleaner is extremely aggressive to to paint. Obviously, it, it breaks it down and also it dries out the brush head. So it, like, with, like with what happened, when I say dry out, what it means is it reduces kind of like the condition of the hair. So obviously we need to then recondition it, which is where brush soap or shampoo or your L'Oreal or whatever you want to put on your brushes comes into comes into effect. All right, okay. Obviously we've got thinner on here now, as I mentioned. What I want to do first of all is I don't want to put thinner onto my brush soap. What I do want to do is obviously give it a rinse. So unfortunately it's not a bomb my man jar. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, it's not a fishbowl either. It's not a fishbowl. It's no, not a fishbowl. It would take up the whole shot. This would have been a great debut too, yeah. for the fishbowl on yeah, the podcast. It would, actually. It it would have been. Been. That, it we'll been. have to do another demonstration that been. includes the fishbowl. So Definitely. I'm just going to wet the brush and then what I'm going to do is obviously introduce it into the brush soap. Now, one thing that's really important is when you're doing this, I'm rotating the brush. And that's I'm the cleanest brush soap I've ever seen. Mine is like it's proper it's, gammy. Has it been off. used or is it brand new? It's brand new. Oh, okay. Brand, brand, well, new, brand new for the yeah. demo. I was like, wow. <laughs> George has never seen a new brush soap before. <laughs> yeah. So same again, I'm working, working it into the bristles and notice that what I'm doing is I'm drawing the brush completely black. There's no forward motion. I don't want to be doing that at all whatsoever. That, that goes for painting as well, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's exactly the same as if you were painting on the surface. But what I'm trying to do is obviously, I'm being quite abrasive with the, with the friction because I want to make sure that I'm working that brush soap all the way through the brush head, okay? You can actually see the colour starting to go on that already. Yeah, it's already starting to come out, which is good. And I, I use grey paint with this brush, so I, I, it's, it's why there's some darker sort of spots and stuff. But what I, what I like to do is also just leave the soap on for a little bit, just literally just to, to, to set in the, in the bristles and just literally make sure that it's working on the material that's there. This, again, takes doesn't take very long per brush when you're in the swing of things and not doing a Blue Peter style demo. If you leave it for too long and the soap dries, is that a problem? Is yeah. it going to like go quite not necessarily, hard? Not necessarily a problem. I've seen people do it and leave it on. You can't, you can do that. I personally don't leave it on. Like, I'd be a bit worried because it's going to like turn into like solid wax. I, um, yeah. I once put all the soap <laughs> on of like all of my brushes and then fell asleep. Fell asleep. Yeah, I like. I left. Was it, it that there. relaxing? Was it? I left it. No, I left it to <laughs> chill there for a little bit. You're like, oh, the soap. I was like knackered. Um, did that, left it to like, just left it for a sec, like went into my bedroom, like laid on my bed, opened side on my laptop, like I was watching it. And I just fell asleep, woke up the next morning and they all still had like, obviously the, the soap and stuff on it. And I managed to clean them and think, I thought it was fine, but they was like, it hadn't like hardened or anything. 
but it was like gummy. It was like, yeah, it was like gooey kind of thing. So yeah, I've soaked, soaked the brush up. So obviously now the, the point is really nice and sharp. Obviously with brush soap on it. It's been on there for a minute or two. Uh, obviously we're going to give it a rinse. All right. Okay. Um, now you can repeat that process a few times, go back to cleaner. If you, it, the thing to do, obviously, once you've done this full clean is obviously just draw it back, form a point. I always use the back of my hand to form a nice sharp point. So you can see, obviously, we've got a lovely, lovely point now on the brush, which is great. Um, and just give it a check and just see, obviously, if there's anything still in the midsection of the brush. There's a little bit on there still. So what I'll then do, again, go back to the cleaner. And you can repeat this a few times until, obviously, you get the process 100% sort sorted with, obviously, the brush not having anything in the, in the midsection at all whatsoever. I guess you kind of know as well by, like, the water being... Uh staying clear i guess it's not getting any yeah any more dis discoloration i guess yeah. you see that when you're starting to use the soap like if it's just staying yeah th this, white the the, the the vessel will end up looking extremely extremely dirty the mortar in there will go if, you, if you're cleaning like multiple sets of brushes you will end up with a lot of um a lot of uh rubbish that's come off the brushes um and the reason why i like doing this is you're kind of like massaging out any paint that's actually in that in that brush head you're getting rid of it by just using your thumb and finger to do it now again i wouldn't recommend using rubber gloves because they do sort of like I put a lot of friction on the actual um on the actual surface of the brush and you can rip hairs out the beauty of your, your your fingers and doing it this way is that it allows you to feel obviously the hair and sometimes if you've got really thick paint in the in the actual brush you'll feel the little like I don't know what what to call them other than like nuggets of paint that's stuck to the bristles I don't <laughs> really know I don't really know what else to call nuggets. them no nuggets is fine nuggets yeah. is um, good so again gonna rinse it Gonna rinse off the cleaner from the brush, reintroduce it into the soap. I always tend to do this once or twice per brush, just literally just to just to obviously make sure that I'm fully cleaning it. All right, okay. Um, so obviously just reapplying soap again. I'm not gonna leave this on like I did the first time. And then all I'm gonna do is rinse that off again, completely rinse it off, and repoint while it's wet. Now the reason why I repoint while it's wet is because brushes, if you leave them um, unpointed, obviously it's not good. But I would always try and put it back into its natural natural shape, which is one of the really important things. So I'm just going to get a lovely point on this brush. All right, okay. We haven't got to the tape yet. I'm wondering why that's going to come in. Coming. Yeah, tapes I was going to say, like, so far he's done the whole process. He's done twice. the normal There's bit. No, no yeah. tape. Yeah. tape. The tape is this coming. Is, this is what I'd expected so far. So I'm waiting for the wild card. Yeah. Tape is coming. So now we've got a lovely point on the brush, okay. But James, why have you got tape? <laughs> getting, getting knocked about the tape ever since the tape appeared on the table. So for good reason, I'm, I'm yeah, pretty sure, no, but no, we'll see. There yeah. is, there is, a, hopefully you'll agree with me a bit of logic regarding the tape. There's all, this is the problem. There's always logic. This there's is what winds logic. us up. Yeah. There's always a good reason for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so always got, mental. Don't get me wrong. So, we'll get to this, by the way. I tested out one of his hobby hacks in the, in the Patreon post show. We'll talk about that. One of the most ridiculous hacks that he's ever pitched, <laughs> ever. I gave it a test. We'll okay, get to that. We'll talk about that George, after. George turned it up to 11. It was too much. That's all okay, I'm going to say. Well, we'll talk about that after. Um, so the tape. This is just airbrush masking tape. Okay. We all have busy desks, busy lives, lots is of brushes. It, is that maybe. the Tamiya stuff? This is the Tamiya like tape. Yeah. Oh, that's the good stuff. This is the good stuff. So the reason why I use tape is as follows. As a final thing, once I've cleaned my brush, I will then get some of the tape and I'll put the tape... Around, oh, that's what the tape around, is on the other brushes. Around oh, I just brush realized. I just, hang on, show, show the other brushes. I just realized that this whole so time there was have, brushes with tape on the I have other brushes with tape on it. And again, this is a cleaned brush. So what this tape means, shows is that this brush has been cleaned. So now when I've got my desk, I can see clean brushes and I can see brushes that have not been cleaned. Did you oh. also think that he was going to somehow be using the tape on the hair? I thought he was going to be, I thought he was going to use it to like get paint out of the ferrule. Get the nuggets out. Like, <laughs> like wrap, the tape, wrap the tape around like the ferrule or something. And then like. Do some sort of flourish. Yeah, yeah. And then like unwrap it and it's got like wax in it basically. Yeah. It'd be like one of those, um, those like blackhead strips. You like peel it off. Okay. Well, once again, <laughs> it's absolutely fine. This is it's kind of very like, good do you know what this reminds me of? It's like when uh, people do food prep and they put the date on it yeah. yeah so this is now so that i know visually on my desk these brushes are clean brushes that are cleaned and are ready to go and you i could, you could use like colored tape for like different cleaning sessions and you know like when it's due so you could switch between sessions and you'd be like oh orange was my last session so that's well that's like when it starts clean. getting dirty you're like ah hang on like you know you've got them like in groups oh okay because like when when that brush starts getting dirty and it's going to need to clean again i'm sure you've got to remove the tape and then put the tape back on well see so, so what i do this is the thing these go uh, uh, and the last thing i say is about brush storage once you've cleaned it now obviously we've still got water on these on the brush head okay please don't ever store your brushes like this as in uh as in just vertical all right okay 
Well, one thing with brushes is obviously you've got a lot of hair in here. It's got a lot of pressure inside the ferrule. When that hair you're talking in there, vertical with yeah, the vertical point with up. the point up. Yeah, when that when moisture or water permeates and recedes into the into the ferrule, that's where that compacted hair can mat and stick together. You don't want that. It counteracts the spring on the brush head. Okay, so it counteracts the flex of the hair, the crimp, and it, it that's what causes brushes to splay. It's when you do get that's why crimp's a good word. That's crimp is I a like good word. Crimp. Yeah. Whenever that's come up, whenever that's come up when we're talking about brushes and say crimp. It, yeah. Like um, crimp. So so the beauty of that now is that it you know it's gonna when you store your brushes when you've cleaned them or even after you've painted I always recommend storing them horizontal. Now some people do store them per, the other way around with obviously the ferrule and the hair pointed downwards to stop obviously water and moisture. Receding. I presume they're doing that with the plastic cap on the end, so you're not yeah yeah mushing you get, the head. You get you get like these storage holders or brush holders that you can hold the other way around. Um, yeah. So I will always leave them overnight after a session just over the edge of a desk like that okay so that that way if i move it this way you can see i store it over the edge of a desk like this so that, that way uh it's just level and then the next day it'll naturally dried through uh, through just air uh, air obviously in the environment uh, and you can pick it up and the, the head will be set a little bit so it'll be a bit harder uh, and then when it comes to painting with it it'll you'll just break it open using a bit of moisture or water or whatever the case may be uh, and that's my process. But what I actually do recommend you do is, is keep all your clean brushes together that you've cleaned. And whenever you take a new brush to use, you just take the tape off. So at the moment of first using it. Oh, so can, the tape is to signify cleaned, not been used. Not been untouched. used. Yeah, untouched. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. That's I the, like it. That's the, that's the reason why I use tape. And I do this, I do a session probably once a week, once a fortnight, and I spend half hour cleaning all my brushes, taping them all once they're all done. Um, Put on your favorite podcast, hopefully this one, um, and and clean your brushes, and then um, and then yeah, there's, then I have a drawer with all my brushes. In my, I've got a not sponsored hobby zone drawer on my desk that's got all my clean brushes in it. Um, and then when I need a new brush, I just take that brush out, take the tape off. It's the one I'm using. I know that. And then what happens is once it's been used, um, I'll just put it in another drawer of brushes that have been used previously. And then I, if I if I need a brush that's like half cooked or half done or I still can still it's still at use before needing to clean I'll go to that drawer if I need a new brush I'll go to the drawer that's got new brushes in it and that's that's typically my my process for for cleaning brushes um, and again the, the the what you can use you, whether you use masters whether you use the the AO soap whether you use um, whether you use any any other sort of like materials or, or things that process is malleable to include other different chemicals or things it, you know have I, you found that there's um so you've used airbrush thinner or cleaner. Yeah. Have you found that there's any um, like replacement for that that's designed specifically for just actual paint brushes? So when I, uh, yeah, so I designed uh, Perger and uh, Cleaner, the two products from AO, um, and they are basically a lot stronger in the way that they break down paint. They're not designed, please do not put that in an airbrush and try and thin or dilute paint with that because that's not what it's for. Um, uh, those two products do the job perfectly as a purple one and as a clear one. And they just, we, I colored one of them as a purple so that it was visually different. So, you know, the, the process of doing this one first, then that one. Um, just, just for transparency as well, for people who may not be aware, you started Artis Opus, you yep. used to work there. Yep. You no longer work for Artis Opus yep. or doing R&D, yep. but we are still affiliated with Artis Opus. Correct, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. For a lot of people think that purple one is just methylated spirit as well because it's, it's purple and it's like, it's not. It's definitely not <laughs> it's methylated. Purple. It's definitely not. It no, we had two, two, when, when I was, so yeah, when, when obviously I was, I was part of our AO, like are we, the cleaning brushes, like I understand how expensive brushes are. When you buy expensive brushes, not looking after them is just a bit counterintuitive in my mind. Um, so I wanted to develop a product that cleans brushes, looks after them and reconditions them. They were both clear when they were first developed and visually, obviously two clear liquids can get confusing. Mm -hmm. Much like this, I wish, I actually wish that thinner or cleaner had a tint to it a little bit. I know for obvious reasons of changing color in paint, it shouldn't obviously, but. Or at least like. The labels. labels. Well, that's an old label. That's oh, that, label. you've got yeah. an old, you've got an old one and a new an one. Old one new so one, that is yeah. actually different. But, but yeah, so we basically put a tint on one of them so that visually you knew which one was the one to use secondary or first, if that makes sense. And that's the reason why they're there. But, but this process works really, really well. I would recommend actually shampoo shampoo is really good because it's designed for hair and then you can use same thing you can use shampoo and conditioner uh, and do both I've, I use, I've used um used a lot of them actually i've used masters i've used the artist soap as one and well that's just soap. i've used yeah that's i've used just, just bar soap as well like if you buy just like the cheap yeah. normal bar of soap because it's just a block you can yeah. literally just run the brush yeah. over yeah. the top of it it's doing the same thing 100 mm. well that's that's essentially what this is this is just soap, yeah so so yeah um but um but 
uh, but yeah, that's 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 the process for clean brushes uh, in your part two Blue Peter tutorial. Um, so yeah, it's pretty pretty informative, isn't it? Not uh, knocking the tape now, are no, we? The tape's a good shout. The tape was good. The tape you can understand our apprehension with the tape because you come out with some. What, do you, what do you think I was going to do? Start. I, re I start really thought you would, James. It's paint. you. I really <laughs> thought that wasn't out of the realms of possibility. Yeah. Neither did Joe. That yeah. speaks volumes. Yeah. No, it's used to mark if they're clean or if they're not. Good idea. Clean or used. Very good. Good idea. Very yeah. good. I like yeah. it. I like it. Does that differ too much from what you would normally do? No, it's about the same. Yeah. yeah. So Apart about from the, tape. the tape. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna. You gonna add the tape in though? I'm considering the tape. <laughs> I'm considering the tape. If you do, I think I might go a step further with the tape because I have a lot of brushes on rotation. Right. And I have like some require cleaning sooner than others because mm -hmm. I use some so gonna, a lot more. You're going to use it for an actual system. I'm going to have a color-coded system. I'm going to have a system. stack, a brush stack, yeah. Joe. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be a priority order. You're going to make cleaning brushes a hobby in itself, George. Yeah. I, yeah. Might, I might do clear tape or just white tape and then have like colored markers. I'm thinking that. Put dots or on. Or I'm thinking literally like food prep. I'm going to put a date on it. I'm going to put a cleaning date on it. Maybe. Little tag. Little, little yeah, tag with a date yeah. on it. My, I'm going to come up with a system. Nice. Yeah. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you'd like to submit to us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please do leave it in the comments down below on YouTube or consider joining the Siege Studios Discord. Uh, we all like to have a little chat in there and there's a channel dedicated for uh, leaving your questions. Uh, this week we have one from Whiskey Dingo who says, a topic that might be worth exploring is uh, healthy hobby habits. Yesterday, I realized I got in the zone and spent six hours hunched over putting my models together. And it made me realize what are some things that we can do to protect our backs, eyes, lungs, etc. in the hobby? Great question. Get yourself, number one, a proper chair to sit in. That will sort your back. So uh, obviously, like there's various different gaming chairs, or is it video gaming chair? Or is it computer gaming chair? What, what is the what is the what is the correct it's terminology? Yeah, it's, it's done, done me there. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. fair. Um, I hate the branding around gaming chairs for one reason. I have a gaming chair and it's brilliant, but I feel like the fact that it's branded as a gaming chair is stupid because it's just a nice office chair. Because vice versa, I've bought gaming chairs I think and they just, are dreadful. They're you, like so bad. You just have like. This vendetta against computer games, I think. <laughs> you just hate you know anything. What, you to must do know what I mean, though. You know the ones that are like blinged out, and they've got like the yeah, but that's head, a different thing. I that think stuff. that's a different thing. Like the, uh, it reminds me of like Skull Candy headphones, right? <laughs> where they're like rubbish, but yeah. they're just in nice bright. It's like the, the uh, Razer keyboard of chairs. Like everyone, yeah. yeah, everyone. When you're younger, like they just look cool, so. You get them because they look cool. Yeah, you don't realize that. Don't, don't be great. fooled by the marketing because yeah, they tend to suck. Um, so, I mean, I haven't tried Skull Candy in a very, very long <laughs> time, but uh, I'm, you know, my experience wasn't wasn't great. What's, with them. what's your chair of choice? I use a Secret Labs Titan Evo. That's my chair of choice currently. Best office chair I've ever had. Not sponsored, but they're sick. I have the one that you sit on in this office. An I have, Omega. Omega. I have that yeah. at home. But I do much prefer the one that I have in this office. That's a Titan. You've got the new Titan, Titan, which is better than my Titan. I've got the older one. Yeah. So I wish I had that. They're Titan off. <laughs> I wish I had that. They done. They done some updates. So the current one has got some new features. I've, mine's a 2020, and mm. you've got some new bougie features that mine hasn't got. Your like lumbar support goes like up and down and yeah. stuff. Yeah. I'd yeah. See, that. I wish I had that at home, but. Um, yeah, you just can't really go wrong with them, can you? They're very yeah. good. They're very I've very had good. mine for 
three years and I was sitting in it for like well over eight hours a day and I was one in the office. Like I they don't wear out. Using, They're very good. Yeah. I was just using a a decent office chair before that. Um that was supposed to have like good back support and all this, but just doesn't compare like was yeah. It? yeah. That I will say though, uh you can't just fix it by buying a nice chair because no, you can still say, sit like a like an idiot, which yeah. I tend to do often. Yeah. Uh, got some bad habits. Yeah. I think I think one of the things and I notice this specifically from classes and when 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 I teach and I see people the way they sit, one of the first things I look at is posture. I think posture for painting um is is tremendously important. And um sometimes it's not even at the fault of the the painter. It's it's due to the circumstances and situation. So what I mean by that is um the light that they're using. And this isn't an opportunity for me to plug uh, one of our uh, to, uh, one of our lights at the, the Onyx, but I will plug it. Um, uh, typically, if if you use a smaller light, uh, typically you see these ones that have got like a disc at the bottom, then they've got the little little sort of like arm. and then like the, the Like the Pixar lamp. The, like the Pixar lamp. That's a perfect analogy. Thank you so much. Everyone knows what um, that means, that don't they? Exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, if you're using one like that, um, because of, it isn't very tall and it's the height actually that, um, that makes you crouch and and hunch down to get under it if that makes sense on classes it's it's like to use a pun it's like turning a light on when i literally pick the light up put it on top of a box and raise it higher immediately that person goes like that yeah so it 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 can be your light so a combination of light and a very good chair will completely eradicate your back problems and i also encourage as well when it comes to actually painting Forcing yourself to sit with your chest or stomach touching the edge of the desk. Tuck uh, yourself in. Tuck yourself right in because it's harder to slouch or, or, or sort of like crouch over when you're in that position. But the thing that actually improves is the ability for you to brace with different parts of your body. So, for example, wrists on the front of the edge are really close to the body. So you've got better control. Um forearms or elbows and then brace in a much better position and i actually prefer bracing with elbows on desk and then the bridge of your hand together so that you can hold the hold a, an object or something or a painting hand or whatever and then brace this hand or your, your painting hand onto the side of your fist and then it gives you much better control do you also, know what i do with the onyx i like about the onyx as well i'll set it like kind of too level. high on purpose so that if i find myself slouching all of a sudden like that beam of light's going directly into my face so I know that I'm. It catch. It's like a. Instant. That's a bit. That is a bit mental. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no. What I'm saying is, if I said it like, I like to blind myself. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No. no, 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 no. You're setting yourself. You've like... misinterpret. You've misinterpreted this. What I do is, I set it to where I'm. Com- I sit in the perfect paint position, and then I set the light at like eyebrow height. Yeah. And then no, that way, if over part. the course of painting I find myself slouching, I will know because I'll be warned by the lights <laughs> will start to shine in my face. Whereas where I'm sat in the perfect painting I, position, it's not shining in my face. I understood it fully. Yeah. The telltale, my, my opinion <laughs> remains, hey, it's a bit wild. The, the but te- yeah, if it works, I, I would just focus on. I would just not slouch. Yeah, great, thank you, Joe. I would just. Do I know that. Sounds, I didn't think of that. No, <laughs> the thing that. is, it's, it's not like it's not like some newfangled rocket science fix. It's literally just sit with your chest touching the desk. Like, it's do just, you it, like? It's, do you not to exclude you from this? But do you, as a taller gentleman, yeah. do you find it harder? Tall. You're tall as me. Okay, I'm about, about six foot, just about. Are you? Are yeah. You? You're taller than me, I think. I thought you were taller than me. Anyway. Okay. Well, do you find it a bit difficult? Because I, obviously... Lower the chair. When, yeah, but then like your knees are up. Like, do you know what I mean? Like if you... Because the table's lower. And then like putting your elbows on the what table. higher, sorry. No, no, no. If you're... If I'm sitting on a chair normally, yeah. obviously the table is kind of a bit lower on my body yeah, yeah, yeah compared to you so you're a, t- a table naturally if you're sat here yeah but you can make you bed someone smaller the thing is, is so what i'm getting at is then when you put your elbows on the table you're leaning down a bit naturally yes so if you do lower the chair then your knees are all up and you're like so what this is this is what i do i'm not like like ridiculously tall by the way no, I'm no, like I, six I one saying. but it's like still a thing two things uh one quips actually mentioned last week about the standing quips desks tall. yeah and he said yeah exactly he said um the reason the standing desk is great, not to stand up and paint, is because they're height adjustable. They so just you can bring yeah. the desk higher. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a great idea. Also, I do not lean on the desk. I lean on the armrests of my chair because they're height adjustable and they've got like the the swivel thing as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get them to a spot where my elbows are nice and comfortable and I'll lean on the, I use the armrests. Both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I use both. I use the arm ends, arms and the desk. Yeah. I think when I'm doing more focused stuff or more controlled stuff, I sit a lot closer, arms on the desk. But if I'm just blocking in and doing con- like control blocking in or whatever, I'll, I'll be a bit more bit more chill and use the arms but you're yeah i mean I, i'm i'm 
Yeah, I know you obviously saying not that you're like uh, <laughs> tiny or anything, but I'm just saying like it's like it's quite funny actually because on this set. James isn't actually that small, but sometimes on this set, just by the way we're all sat and stuff, James looks just looks have, absolutely tiny. When we're like next to each other on the showcase thing, it yeah. looks like. On, on the Quipster episode, when it cuts to the wide, Quip, Quipster was sitting up quite a lot and like leaning onto the chair and James yeah. happened to be slouching <laughs> yeah. and it just looked absolutely dwarfed. It looks it was like I'm perspective. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like in Lord of the Rings. Rings. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that bad. So yeah, yeah. yeah, no. Well, I'm not, yeah, I'm 5'8", so I'm not the tallest, but I'm not the shortest. Um, but yeah, like I just, yeah, I, I think you can tailor any any desk really or chair to match each other so you can get in that comfortable position the other thing i'll throw in it's something that i'm actually exploring and looking at, at the moment now is like with any office environment um health and safety is like a massive thing and um and having something under the desk for you to put your feet on to just give your feet a bit of uh, comfort as well i thought that was a bit of a, a gimmick though so i've seen those like ergonomic like footrests and stuff mm. i always thought that was a bit of they like do a... they do help maintain just uh, maintain a better position of you like for, for just comfort as well it does All help right, so it is something i'm looking at because i think it could be beneficial but um one final thing i want to tack on to this because whiskey dingo mentioned lungs which i was very glad to see uh, yeah. as soon as i saw that i was like this that's george's department drives me i've gone about this a lot to be fair like this drives me so mental and it infuriates me the two things that people throw out all the time oh, the paint's non-toxic. So therefore, if I atomize it into microscopic little things and spray them into the air when we're cleaning and stuff, it's absolutely fine to inhale. It's not. That's insane. <laughs> Second of all, YouTubers, I'm calling you out, the terrible examples that people set of like spraying with an airbrush, using like oils, like without masks and stuff when they're using like the thinners and stuff, it's ridiculous. Your lungs are very, very important. You will need them later in life <laughs> to breathe and to stay alive. And people don't realize... Because if you're, you know, younger, you're doing all this stuff and you don't realize that. Late, it's, because it's not affecting you now, you know, it's going to show up later. And I've had family members, unfortunately, who have passed from problems with their lungs. And it was all from stuff that they did when they was like in their 20s. And they've already done the damage, didn't know at the time. And then 50 years later, unfortunately, I, I think it's all the problems. As well, like you say, where, where if there's YouTubers who are obviously to younger people viewed as like a trusted person yeah and they're demonstrating that they're not taking that care and they're often older even if you if you're a youtuber and you're in your 20s and a 15 year old's watching you they think you're about 40 i'm just you might as well be 40 like, <laughs> like um so they they see you as an adult and a, and a trusted person it's like oh well they've done that this whole time and they're fine so so i'll do it it's um, the thing that bothers me as well it's like it's so easy to wear a mask and it doesn't like hinder you in any way you can still work normally it's not something that's like making it more difficult to do what you're doing like it's just so easy just throw on the mask like if you're doing airbrush if you're airbrushing in the house get one of those booths they're really cheap with the extractor that goes outside yeah you know have ventilation in the room wear a mask while you're doing it wear a mask after the fact and if you're outside even if you're outside using rattle cans and stuff like breathing in that propellant it's really really toxic it's horrible mm. for you it's yeah. going to cause problems and it's an exposure thing as well it's like, yeah, you do it once, you'll probably be fine. But if this is your hobby and you're spending like dozens of hours a week doing it and you're doing it for like 10, 15 years, like the amount of like paint that you've breathed in, thinners that you've breathed in, cleaners, propellant from spray cans, it's insane. Uh, I really hate to see people not taking proper care. Spray masks are so cheap. Um, don't get the crappy like, you know, COVID doctor's Paper mask or whatever. Ones, yeah. Get proper 3M. 3M with the respirator, with the filters. It's, six, get it's 610, 6101. L, I think yeah, the, check the, the codes of what yeah. the filters are for because they have different like ratings and they're suitable mm. for different things. You want like the gas and vapor one, I think. Yeah. Is well, there's one specific for painting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get one of those. Yeah. Like it's it's gonna it's gonna serve you. You, can get, you yeah. can get good deals on like a face the mask and then like multiple sets of the filters yeah, yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Um, your your wish when you're 70 dying of lung cancer that you'd spent 45 quid on a spray mask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's all I'll say on that. Yeah. Uh, on that. <laughs> bleak note uh hobby hacks this is our weekly tradition on the podcast <laughs> where we share this a quick tip hobby hack with you we've had uh, a plethora through the episode such as the tape for example yeah uh we've had some good ones yeah uh, i'm guessing by the facial expressions you're putting right now show you've not prepared a hobby hack no i had one I, i've just for the listeners i've just sat here for like five minutes <laughs> trying to come up with it um i had one and i've completely forgotten it so I do not have one, I'm afraid. James? Well, 
the vessel returns. Um, I uh, that's his. That's his new. Can that be his new? Uh, his new name. The what, vessel. The vessel. I prefer. I prefer. I still prefer the Walt Sniper. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. So this isn't just good for cleaning your brushes. Um, I use these. What, what, hang on. What is it? For the listeners, the vessel is a small um, sort of metal. Imagine like a dog bowl, like a dog water bowl, but <laughs> dog shrunk bowl. down. Shrunk <laughs> down. Like yeah. said scale. It, like, it looks like, well, it's a bit deeper in proportion. Yeah, but it's like scaled down. It's like a, it's like so been if you shot had, with a if, shrink ray. If you had a it's min- even got like the lip the where like, lip, you know yeah. where you would put a dog bowl into in the, the plastic like. The little riser yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I imagine it's Hold something, up, right, James. it's something to do with Cooking, I would imagine. From well, Ikea. it's from IKEA. I have no idea. I've got a pack of three of them for like. What does it say? A, what does it say? Has it got the name on it? No, it has not got the name. I did check that. Oh, I want to know the, the Scandi name for it. No, it's no, it's two zero seven zero eight two three. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go on IKEA and I'm going to search vessel. It's definitely, <laughs> not, it's definitely not going to come um, up. But yeah, it's a small, yeah. small vessel. So the reason why, I mean, obviously, I've brought this for the brush cleaning that we've uh, shown on the, uh, the the episode, but. Um, I use this for quite a few things actually, um, both in sort of actual function and also just as a as an object. And I want to just sort of explain and talk about that a bit more. Um, so when I need to strip tiny little parts of paint, uh, I use BioStrip, which is a commonly known uh, sort of uh, miniature stripping sort of like chemical that you can use um, for those of you across the pond in the states. Like simple, simple green or simply green or something like that. I think is what is quite common common practice over there. Um, simple green, I think. I think yeah. simple green. Yeah. Um, I actually, I've had it many a time where I've been stripping models or stripping parts in the sink and unfortunately they've gone down the plug hole, um, which is not fun. Um, I actually just put the parts inside this and then put a little bit of the bio strip in this. I make sure obviously it stays within there, strip the paint off of it within this, clean it within this, um, rinse this out, take the part out, rinse this out and then use water. So it's all done in this. Um, so that's one thing I use it for. It's really good for also for if you're not using ketchup bottles to make up big, um, big sort of batches of paint for like long, long projects. Um, I use this to mix a load of paint and then decant it into my airbrush as I'm working. Um, the other thing that I actually really recommend something like this is because it's metal. For those of you that paint non-metallics and for those of you that um, that sort of like want to look about look at sort of like reflections at light placement and understanding sort of like shapes and volumes. This is a combination. This is obviously like a cylinder, which is quite good. Um, and from wherever you're viewing it, from wherever you're viewing it, you'll see the light obviously hitting it and have various different colors and tones and reflection points and et cetera. It's really good for understanding sort of like what, how an object specifically something that's metallic actually interacts with light. I've never seen someone get so much value out of just something the, so the, simple. The, the cost per hour. Of oh, this, sake. of the vessel. <laughs> Don't trigger people again. Come the on. The cost per hour of the vessel, I would say, is probably better than video games. <laughs> probably better than computer games. Because people are just spending, aren't they? We all know that. They're just spending loads on you can, Steam. You can the... sit and look at that for hours. Yeah. Hours yeah. and hours. Yeah, you can sit yeah. and look at it. No, but in, in, all, in all seriousness, it's really good for just understanding like cylind- a cylinder and how a metallic cylinder uh, interacts with light um, and just shows obviously the refractions, like first uh, or main highlight, secondary highlight, et cetera. So I've seen, so, um, I've seen really, really tiny versions of them on Amazon, like little like five mil ones. I yeah. think they could be probably quite good Th- as well. This was literally a passing purchase. I was in Ikea. That's shopping. how they get you. Yeah, that's, that's how, how they get you. Get you. Market hall, we've all been there. And, I, <laughs> and I, was, I was like, I could use that actually for this and for this and for this and for this. And then, yeah, it's just really good. The other thing, like like a, like a cup on an airbrush because it's metallic and it's it's silver, um, it shows colour really well. So when you're diluting paint or thinning paint or you're making mixes or whatever, it doesn't really change or tarnish the color too much of what you're mixing so it's really good um, and it's much safer to mix in this uh which is very similar to the the the, the, the cup on the, an airbrush and then decant what you need into the airbrush to avoid blockages or too much paint in there um so yeah so i get max value out of these this it literally i've, max I've got value yeah max it's value. really good so uh so yeah nice uh, i hope that helps yeah all right so you 3d <laughs> print one of them <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. We're going to jump over now to the Patreon bonus segment of the podcast. So if you want to see some exclusive uh, additional content for these episodes every single week, then consider signing up to our Patreon link down below. Otherwise, we will see you next week. Uh, Do you remember the ice cube hobby hack that James said about the wet palette a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. Thought I'd give that a go. I've seen a couple of people try this.